good morning and welcome to multi-dimensional optimization with at risk so we're going to look at a portfolio model this morning where we can basically um, constrain or optimize various dimensions and look at the same problem in very different ways and do solution analysis so the first thing I would would like to talk about is who we are, just give you a sense of what we do. So we work with our clients to improve this, uh, decision making and business outcomes by providing model building, time series, simulation, and optimization within the context of strategy, so planning and decision making, enterprise project management, and enterprise performance management. Our philosophy is that analytics is more than just software and geeks. We need to have uh, strategy, business analysis, people are involved in this, so they need to adopt it, and we work on all of these aspects. Uh, essentially, uh, our, our method revolves around this, this model over here, where we set an objective, and we recognize that in every organization, there are three levers to improving, um, to achieving an objective, and in our case, it's having a analytics capability. Uh, people with training, technology with software, tools, operations, having the right business processes in place. And the approach basically looks at continuously improving these levers, but doing it within the context of what's happening in the marketplace. So this is kind of how we approach all our things, and you'll see this philosophy throughout the presentation. So that's what we do. And this more, um, okay, whoops. Um, so who we do it for? Some of our clients include uh, some of the name, many names you'll probably recognize, including the United States Geological Survey, um, Schlumberger, some work in mining, manufacturing, uh, financial services, um, and even retail. And this, we, we've done stuff in uh, engineering, construction, project valuations, and so on. We work with, uh, alongside with Palisade, we work with uh, a bunch of analytic solutions. So we, have, we try to bring a wide perspective to what we do. This is your presenter for today. So I would like to say this handsome gentleman over here, that's me. Um, as I mentioned, I've worked with a bunch of, my, our, or our organization and myself have worked with several very notable clients. Uh, I have a master's degree in um, information uh, management of information. Uh, I have um, I've worked on several uh, mega projects, billion dollar plus for doing uh, risk analysis. I've done portfolio op uh, optimization, financial uh, analysis, financial options. Um, I started my career doing change management in organizations adopting ERP, and uh, I have a fetish for time series. And I do a lot of, and I'm one of the guys over here that does a lot of the VBA. We developed ad, custom add-ins, uh, you know, stuff that incorporates at risk and other tools into one toolbar. And we're certified for a bunch of, I'm personally certified for a bunch of solutions, including at risk, crystal ball, model risk, solver, et cetera. So let's get to the meat of it. So we're going to start off by covering what is portfolio theory. So we're going to go through a couple of slides. We're going to go through them fairly quickly. Then we're going to show you what the real model is, so this viability fit thing, that this, this multidimensional model. Then we're going to go in Excel. We'll run it. We'll see what it does. Then we're going to go back to it, to our presentation for a bit, and we are going to cover optimization, and then we'll see how that impacts the results in our model. Okay? So. A quick overview. What is portfolio theory? Well, a nice, uh, a nice definition for it is that it's a selective allocation of limited resources. And I would like to add to certain targeted business objectives. So either you, have, you want to develop new capabilities, new markets, higher returns, etc. Your portfolio strategy can be quantitative or qualitative, as in most things. Just like risk management is qua uh, usually qualitative and risk analysis is quantitative. They both go hand in hand. So that's, that's the very high end. And why would you do this? Well, we talked about allocating resources. And we come back to our model here. And we need to know how much we're gonna, we want to develop in people. Do we need to hire? Do we need to train? Uh, do we want to be very good at doing certain things better than our competitors? Uh, is it because we have technology that we want to buy or deploy? 
we have physical and tangible assets. So all of these things, if you just if you combine them in the right way, you should get a higher level of return than if you don't combine them in the right way. And we'll cover that in a bit. So just a, a quick, a very quick uh, overview of classic portfolio models. So we all remember the BCG uh, uh, portfolio model, which took, which used um, learning curve theory. So people who are familiar with learning curves that say that over time, as you do something, it should take less and less time and be more and more efficient, and it becomes cheaper. And they used this, and they looked at what was the market growth and the market share. And so this could be almost quantitative or qualitative, depending on how mathematically rigorous. Um, for those who aren't familiar with it, you know, question marks are risky things that you invest in hoping they'll pay off, but you don't know. Start, then these can, if they do pay off, they become strategic, which means that they give you a competitive advantage over, your, over everybody else, and not everybody is doing this. When everybody's doing it, because it's a standard practice, kind of like when organizations adopted Sabre, you know, they, these businesses become cash cows. They just milk them, and so they don't grow very much because the market's not growing, but they're profitable. And then dogs are, you know, what they are. They're not, they're weak in the market, and they're not very profitable. So that's the BCG model. Then GE and McKinsey had another take on it, and they talked about, and this was a much more qualitative thing, where they talked about industry attractiveness. Now, I defy someone to, to quantify that without, uh, you know, uh, easily. And then the other one is business strength, and that's probably a little more quantifiable. So this is when we talked about a more qualitative model, and you would put your businesses or your projects, and you would kind of figure out where they fit here. And then we talk about financial, financial uh, portfolio theory, which is mean variance optimization, which was developed by um, Harry Markowitz back in the 1950s. This guy got a, um, a Nobel Prize for this. And the, essentially what he was doing is that he was saying, if the more gain that I can make against how risky it is, the riskier it is, the, higher I should, the more money I should be able to make, and the less risky. The, so anything that was, was below here was kind of suboptimized as a portfolio. And everything that was above here was, was unfeasible. So he called this thing the efficient frontier. And it is, it is the optimized function between return and expected risk. So you could use uh, risk being, you know, standard deviation so of returns. So this is a, this is a very powerful uh, theory, but it's really financial. So, but there are things to take away from it. Each of these brings something different. And, and this is just a highlight because there are a lot more portfolio models. I mean, we could spend the entire day just outlining which ones exist. But these are some big ones. Now, let's take us to the viability fit approach, which is probably a more modern uh, uh, and agile way of doing it. And I'll explain to you why. So the first thing is that the viability portfolio model is a powerful approach that is designed to align either projects or businesses or any type of it or vendors to your business objectives which, like we said, could be you know, new markets, higher returns, et cetera. And, and this is, methodology is not rigid. It can be very easily adapted. It was initially developed by a gentleman known as Anthony Tian, and he was doing this at Sun Microsystems in the, late, in the 90s. Um, essentially, they had uh, like 1,400 internet projects, and they didn't know what to do with it, and he brought it down to 140. So he, did, he basically lopped off 90% of all the projects um, by putting it through this approach. This article is published because for, for those of you who will want to replicate the model that I put forward, it is, it, it's very easy to do it because he outlines it in finally a way to put your internet portfolio in order in the February 2001 Harvard Business Review. So. Um, I can, there, the exact reference is a little further, it, I think is on the next slide. So the viability fit model is this. So by having, uh, by calculating um, using a Likert score you know, uh, for a fit 
and actually binding. So relativizing on a scale of 1 to 100 financial and operational viability of, of your opportunities, you can decide what you will do with clear action. Do you invest in it? Do you redesign the opportunity? Do you just kill it because it's just costing you too much? Or it, you, die, you spin it off. So it, it, it's a really good project, but it doesn't meet really what you're trying to accomplish with the business. Why don't you let someone else have it? So this is the viability fit model, and um, I've applied it using in vendor analysis and project selection, and um, in a host and in strategic context. So it's a very very simple and power, and everybody gets it. So viability f uh, fit uh, approach versus traditional models avoids certain alignment failures. So the first problem is uh, called let the a thousand flowers bloom which means that all the projects get funding, good or bad. So to do that, you know, to do er let all the flowers bloom, you probably need a lot of fertilizer. And for those of you who've been doing, who know what fertilizer is and who've done some gardening, you know that it never smells right, and you'll probably have some all the way up to your knees. The other problem with letting a thousand flowers bloom is that weeds will get in the mix. And what do weeds do? Weeds suck resources from good flowers and good plants. That's why in the spring or during the summer, your mother always told you, go out and take the weeds out of the garden. Or at least mine did. Um, probably a way to get me out of the house, too. Anyways, I digress. The next, so letting a thousand flowers bloom, not so great. Another problem a lot of companies can face is that they want to bid it all on a winner. I mean, they have their winning horse. But what happens when you pick the wrong horse? You could basically set your company into oblivion. And um, company uh, corporate history is littered with companies who have bet on the wrong horse. So that's probably not a great way of going about it either. So portfolio management is important there. And then the third one is shameless opportunism. So no long-term vision. So people see that I have a picture of um, um, uh, Trump. Uh, when you put Google, shameless opportunism, his picture comes up a lot in the picture search. So I figured it must mean something. So what we have is shameless opportunism, no long-term vision. So, we, so basically you have a portfolio of things that are not going to achieve what you want it. So you're no, you're no better off. So we want to avoid these things. So we're getting close to the, to the meat of it. So the first thing is that if we, if we contrasted what classical planning versus viability, so we took all of what we talked about. So traditional planning is used in markets that are more mature. They usually have really long planning cycles, five to 10 years. And as we saw, both the McKinsey and the BCG, which for, for 30 years were, were um, were the word in strategy, uh, they dealt with industry growth and market position, which is kind of fuzzy. And you wouldn't be able to have that information unless you were in a market which had those numbers to give you in the first place, which, as we said, would have to be more mature. So like steel and, and you know, selling plumbing and electrical supplies, these are all numbers where you can go to the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics or Statistics Canada and get that. But if you're in, in an emerging market, this isn't there. Uh, you're not thinking about creating new businesses as much as you're thinking about getting rid of them, because this is what these business, this type of approach implies. And it is very capital, it focuses on capital intensity. Versus, um, versus the, uh, on the other side, the, the viability fit approach, it is, it's used in highly dynamic sectors, so high tech uh, projects, you know, um, uh, construction, so on. Well, though you wouldn't say that construction is highly evolving, but their methodologies are, and they need to be able to pick which projects they want to bid on. The environment requires you to be nimble. There, you want to be able to see if something is viable and if it works with your business. You want to be able to validate, use your portfolio to validate stuff across the business from top to bottom. Um, and of course, it, it, it deals with resource allocation, and we'll see that in, in the next slide. And here, for those who want it, here's the uh, reference. 
Some of the differences are that um, is the focus on resource allocation because they don't focus on it in the same way. You're, you're, um, you're basically looking at value creation over here, whereas here you're looking at harvesting. And you have to be able to categorize your businesses right, which is not always obvious. He said it was kind of fuzzy. So this is the way it works. And, it, and I promised I would show you how this thing, so basically we create ranges. So these criteria are things you can set. Okay? For the purposes of our analysis, we use these criteria to define if a business opportunity is viable. So if it makes business sense from a financial and operational standpoint, this criteria could be much more elaborate. Okay? So in, and you could have buildups to define those ranges. The first one is to say, if I wanted to have market value, so if, it, if the market value of my initiative is less than 5 million, then I don't want to consider it. It's worth zero points. If it gives me more than 150 million or more, that more than be, goes beyond my expectations. The same thing can go with implementation time. So how, you know, how long is it going to take us to deploy the initiative? How long is it before we, get ca we go to positive cash flow? Uh, do we need to throw a lot of people at this? And, do we, and how much money can we do? So if a, if a project is worth too much, well, you know, it's just, we just can't afford it. So, so all of these things will either work in favor or in disfavor of a project. And the import, to be able to, to create your math, you need to be able to create a relative scale. And that's why you have the range calculations here. And you're able to, so it, you divide your 100 points by 145,000 by 100, and then you, you work it out that way. Uh, so using that factor, you will be able to derive how many points it is. It's a very simple rule of three. So the viability, like we said, defines the financial and, and operational attractiveness of an opportunity. Uh, it should be adapted to your business, so if you have more things or you would have build-outs for these various categories. It's a 100-point scale, and it's relative, and it's very easy to come up with. And what's, what's really interesting is that, say you look at the market value, and you have a three, you have a, um, a triangular distribution that says, well, I think this opportunity could make between, you know, uh, as market, could be as a market value of 25, you know, on the lower point, you know, you know, 75 on the midpoint, maybe 130 on the high point. Well, every time it's going to simulate, it will recalculate the portfolio and it'll, the, re, the relative positioning of that opportunity. So when you, when you simulate it, you're getting stochastic or sim, uh, stochastic optimization, you know, simulation optimization. It's kind of, it, it's kind of cool to look at. So the next one, whoops is fit. It's a 10-point Likert scale. We've all seen them. And it, basically, the, the subject matter experts are, and again, you can have more quantifiable buildups, but they need to produce a scale of 1 to 10 on, you know, does this opportunity, you know, fit with my organizational structures? Um, the, does it fit with the, the values and the culture that we have? Is, it, is there ease of implementation? So do we, do we have uh, the mindset to get it done right, the skills? Uh, does it fit in with some of the other things that we're doing, or is it kind of a black sheep? Does it tie into to the, the core capabilities of the business? So is it leveraging things that we already have, or are we trying to do something new? For resources, you know, do we have the people? You know, just from a, a, a quality to see if it fits. And, and again, this list can be very exhaustive. Um, so the last piece of this, and this is where we kind of innovated on the Harvard Business Review approach, is that we incorporated uh, the applied information economics approach. So he, he explains it in his book, uh, How to Measure Anything, which is a really good read. Um, and I highly recommend it to anybody who has to estimate projects or costs or anything. And what he's saying is that when you want to, uh, to have better information, you need to figure out how much it would cost. So if you were going to do a project and it, you could make $10,000 with it. But if you had better information on 
on what your competition was doing or what's happening in the marketplace or new technologies being developed, you could maybe make 20,000 because you could, you could take the market early. Well, that, that information is worth money. And his approach calculates, and it's based on value of information, which is classical stuff, which has been around for a long time, but is, he has a particular take on it, is how much I should invest, how much money I should set aside to get that information and make that opportunity work. So um, it, it gives you a quick assessment, and I provide the formula here. So his threshold, okay, is the NPV at zero. So what is the, the present value? Uh, of the project, or in the case we've used it, we used it as a break-even cost, Mind the, my, minus the absolute minimum of what that project could do, and then it, it's set to the power of 2 divided by 2 over the loss rate, which is a, a factor that you can define as 1 or whatever. So for each dollar that you're off, what, how much would it incur to the business? So it could be a 10 to 1 ratio. So if you didn't invest in it, and you had a security leak because you ran a credit card, you know, you have a credit card uh, business and you have a liability, you might be looking at an investment that might have cost you a dollar to do it, but if you didn't do it, and it, it, you would be looking at $10 or, $10 or $100 to each investment dollar you would have had as a loss. So it takes that into account. All right, so now we're going to get into uh, looking at the model. And first thing we want to talk about are the management questions we're looking at resolving here. How much money, how much can I generate with my portfolio? How much will my portfolio, these are classic questions, and you don't need to do the viability approach to ask them. So, but we're going to deal with them. And how likely is it to make my numbers? And this is when at risk comes into play. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to share um, monitor two. All right. So, so this is this is a, the model that we put together. So the very first thing that we did is that um, I'll just uh, show the dashboard first. So this is dashboard. It, we're just doing a bunch of V lookups in our per, previous table that we were looking at, and we have our criteria, which again, so this is just a dashboard. And we can see that the top seven projects for the business are listed up and they're all in the invest category. Um, because this can get pretty tedious to be able to assign the range, uh, the labels to each one of these to, to model them, I stopped at seven. But you could add as many as you like. And in fact, in the other chart, we use the scatter plot, and you can see which opportunities do go in the other quadrants. So the first thing that we want to look at is this table. And so we have our, our list of initiatives. So in our portfolio, we have different statuses. So we have projects which are complete, some which were deferred. And then we have uh, the ones that are in progress and those that are planned. And that's important because, based on that, we are able to create a, uh, some um, if statements that say if it's planned or if it's in progress, multiply your, you know, if the project is on and then by whatever thing, and it will give you the aggregate revenue, the aggregate effort, and so on, which are all over here, which you can see. So uh, the revenue product, which is one by basically one times the revenue, and then it sums it up. So we have, as we talked about, we have our criteria, revenue potential, and they are listed here. And then we added some additional items, OK? So some of these items are called opportunity cost. So we, we claim that within our business, we have um, we have to fund, we have to pay for the time that we spend on, on one project versus another. So we take an internal rate, and then we multiply that by the number of, by the effort. And then we know that if, since that, you know, within the company, this is what it'll cost to, in terms of labor. So opportunity cost is your, your ad hoc labor cost. Then you have financial requirements, which are simulated. And then your financial requirements plus your opportunity uh, costs give you your total opportunity cost. And then 
your revenue expectation minus your total organizational cost gives you what your revenue would be. That, and, and using our scoring methodology that we explained by using the point system in this formula over here, we are able to assign a relative point score to that. So 19,000 is worth 11.18 on this scale of between 5,000 and 150. It's pretty straightforward stuff. And then the same with implementation and so on. And then over here is when we, where we actually put in the fit criteria. So what you can see is that we, we have a scoring system of 1 to 3, 4 to 7. So it enables you to give to grade kind of where you feel. So it's high, medium, low with a high, medium, low embedded in it. And that's much easier to calculate because it's just a, an average score. And then we sum the scores. And then using the, the, a, uh, the sum score, we are able to rank each opportunity in the portfolio. And this is dynamic. So if the numbers change, so with their ranking. So why are we using this? Well, it's because at some point here, we want to know what are our top five projects. And then lastly, but so, and then here, as you saw, there were the green cells for revenue potential. So we went to the subject matter experts, and we had them each provide us estimates of what we thought the revenue potential was, three-point estimate on implementation days, three-point estimate on time to positive cash flow. The personnel requirements were fixed, though those, these two could be a distribution. And then how much you would actually have to invest, which is also a distribution. And then the opportunity cost is a calculated field, and that's how we come up with our total organizational cost. We'll return to this over here is the VOI, but I'll come back to this in a second. So, so now what we're looking at is that we have the aggregate. So these blue cells are the things that we actually care about knowing what's going on. So these are our output forecasts and at risk. And the, cur the way that the portfolio is set up, OK, we're going to, and just to make sure that we have all our deferred projects should be 0, OK. So we have 1,400 points. So this is the scoring of our portfolio, which takes into account both the financial and operational viability and the organizational fit of your portfolio. The higher that score is, the more your portfolio is aligned to the business objectives and the criteria you gave it. And what we're going to do is see how this portfolio performs. So we're going to make the we're going to make all the stuff we're not working on disappear. And these color codes here tell you that when a project is selected, it will highlight red. So here we go. So we're going to simulate this sucker for a 5,000 trials. And let's get it to go. And while we do that, uh, let's see if there's anybody that has any questions up till now. Sure, anybody, if you have any questions, you can just type them in your chat panel. I'll read them off to Eric. So what, we'll, what we're seeing here is that we even have, as it's running, we have a li this cool little matrix that, that I have to admit you don't find uh, anywhere else where you can see the numbers evolve uh, with their distribution. A lot of other packages will pull up all the charts, and they will be dynamic as well. But to have them put into a results matrix is kind of novel. So we can see how our numbers are evolving. And we're going to take a quick look at, at these. So by the way, I, I, I know that I have some old friends and colleagues on the line. So I just wanted to say hi. Hi, Jean-Philippe. Thanks for, your, for your, uh, your, thanks for joining us today. Hope you'll give me a call this week so we can catch up. Anyways, um, so we've well, we run our, beg your pardon? I think we have one question. Uh, All right. Uh, uh, go ahead with that question. 
Also, I just want to make sure that the pace is okay and I'm not going over anything too quickly. Uh, it's about that methodology is about FEL, front end loading. That's the question we have. Um, I'm not quite, I, I think I need a little more clarification because sure. front end loading can mean a lot of things. Sure. While they clarify that question, I'll just present a bit the results that we have. Okay, sure. Or maybe we'll come back and revisit this. We'll, we'll okay. get some more details and we'll revisit it. Perfect. Okay, very good. So over here we have what our revenue potential is. So we have the mean, the max, the five, the nine. So all the wonderful statistics that we might that we might want to see. And if we wanted to get the to see the, the full chart, we can pull it up like this. One way of doing it is like this. And you'll have your basic statistics over here. And we know that if we're dealing in, um, well, it, it auto summarized the, uh, here, we'll take the scale off. So we have here that we know that it, the, value, the, port, the revenue potential of this is that we have about, and we're just going to pull this up. So we could probably, we have a 58% chance, or sorry, a, uh, beg your pardon, a 70%, I'm just move it there, 50. So we have a 50-50 chance that we could probably be doing better than 404, which is our mean. And if we were looking at being, because we're very conservative, right, and we, we want to know, this portfolio, as it is, as it is allocated, would have, at nine times out of 10, would generate uh, 210, uh, we'll talk in thousands in this case, $210,000 versus um, half a million. So we might want to do better than that. Let's look at some of the other numbers, and we're going to do it through the spreadsheet itself. So we can have over here, and um, okay, Matt doesn't want to show me my automatically show output graph. Okay. So over here, if we take this graph, there we go. So then if we look at how much we would have to invest, we see that it, we have a 90% confidence interval that would be between 327. So 19 times out of 20, we'd have to come up with 337 um, uh, dollars, really strange. And 400, and so this must be summarized in some way. And this is how we should look at it. We, so we have our total investment. Our total organizational cost, I think, is a more reflective, because in a lot of these, when we set up the, the example, uh, there wasn't a lot of investment here. But let's look at the cost, and that's a lot more substantial. So let's browse the result there. And there we go. So for this portfolio that could generate between anywhere between 200 and 600,000, we would have to invest anywhere between 16 to 20,000 um, dollars. Not bad. And then we have our profit potential. So the other thing is once we have done this, then we can look at what were the top five projects that we should be looking at. And these top five projects follow the Pareto rule. They, 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 they amount to, not always, but about 80% of the portfolio is in, is in the, the revenue potential are in these five projects. And they are worth this much. And as you optimize, when you're done optimizing and you've come up to an optimal result, it will, this is the list you would want to work on first. So uh, that's one way of, of cutting through the weeds. Then the other aspect, and I hadn't talked about it, uh, well, I mentioned it, but I hadn't addressed it in the model, is this VOI, so this value of information formula. So we took Hubbard's method, and we said, you know what, we probably, not only do we have money that we have to throw at the opportunity, but we should also throw money at the research. And we have a budget for how much we can invest, you know, in, in doing capital or software expenditures. But we also have a budget that we must respect for VOI. And therefore, when we start talking about multidimensional optimization, you can pick in most in all optimization tools, you can only optimize one variable at once, but you can constrain it or, or apply requirements any which way you like. And this is no different in risk optimizer. 
And when we do this, we know that this particular portfolio, if we wanted to achieve our mean, you know, get close to achieving our mean results, we're looking at a $4,000 investment. So if we don't have the 4000 if we have to put a constraint, say, well, I only have 3500 or 2500 to invest, that's fine. You put it that, and then it will construct your portfolio in that regard. Same can be said with how much actual investment, you know, how much capital uh, expenditures you can allow. And then the other things that we put in as, um, is that you have your max effort. So in here, we calculated what the effort was for each one of these projects. And given that we have limited, there, in, in almost all organizations, we have limited financial, uh, sorry, human resources, especially if you're dealing in IT or 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 R and D where expert resources, um, you know they you, you you can't replicate them. You want to replace someone on a project, you have a learning curve that can take many months. So that takes that into account. So you have constrained resources. And what we're going to do is we're just going to look at how that we came about that. So we put what the opportunity cost was, which actually happened to be the negative, uh, you know, our expense versus how much we thought we could make on it. And we had the calculation. This is how we derived our max. And this gave us our value of information. And this is so in, in order to achieve better results, this is how much money we should be investing on each one of these initiatives based on what their potential and their break even is. Again, um, is this clear? Does, does anybody have any questions thus far? I think I had one question that came in. Yep. Oh, uh, project number 22 shows a loss. Still, it's selected. Can that be explained? Oh, for sure. The for the loss is it, it, we, when you compare the loss. It is. Let's look at the let's look at the graph over here. So, project 22 is project number four, and. We have that over. So let, so project 22 is over here. So what's happening is that even though it is it is it's losing money, because the criteria is not purely financial. It is a question of of uh, it has. So first of all, it has a pretty good fit. So it has an 83 per, uh, point score on the fit. So that put, puts it up here. This is where it is. Now on the viability, you have four other sorry, uh, one, two, three, yeah, four other criteria beyond market potential that would justify doing it. So if it's quick, if it's that, so it, all the other things seem to work out, and it might be that this project is strategic, and that's why we still left it in the mix, and it, notwithstanding the market value. It's achieving all its, it, it can be done. So it could even be a maintenance project that you deem as being important. Does that answer the question? I believe so. Why, why does column B have some planned projects starting with a value of zero and others at one? How do you decide on this initial value? OK. So the, if, that's a very good question. We could, if we wanted to say, so let's take the scenario of let the flowers bloom. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna take this guy and we're gonna put it at one across the board. So we so every project that came across our desk, we decided we were gonna fund it. Okay, so this is what our part for, and obviously our opportunity, our scoring goes through the roof, right? But look at our investment. Our investment went from uh, like 20 grand, you know, to 652,000. And as a, and our budget, if we were to set our budget, uh, and our value of information would be 200,000. So there's some big, big uh, hitters in there that we might want to, so if we don't have the 200,000 to, to start off, so at some point you might have a meeting with your managers and they will tell you what their preferences are, and that might account for why you would get a portfolio where some of these are planned, but they're not selected. 
But to get started, you're absolutely correct. We can set the baseline as such, and here we're just going to and we're going to run it. Take five thousand. Start simulation. Five thousand. And fortunately, at risk is there now. While I'm while I'm waiting, I'm going to give you guys some a, some a quick tip. Okay, when you're running a a substantial model, you can you can accelerate your your um, your model running. Okay, by going to Excel, and then setting the priority to real time. And look what's going to happen to the speed here. Okay, do I have more than one instance of Excel running? Yes, I do. That's why it's not. Okay, let's yeah. do that. Set prior. And it's set to real time. So when you, when you set that to real time, you can go and achieve a 20 to 30% improvement in your run time. Another way of, of achieving a speed improvement is if you minimize everything, and I mean everything, um, especially, in fact, if you were doing VBA, you would use an Excel minimized command, and a um, and you would freeze the the screen update. And if you do that, you can you can you can go and well, the the real time thing will give you 10 percent, and those two other pieces of advice will give you 30 percent. So if it was running at a thousand, it'll run at uh, trials, um, you know, per minute or whatever. It will be running at 1300. Just a way to okay. So I, anyways, I, for the point, for the purposes of our of our uh, discussion, I'm just going to stop this, and we're going to look at the numbers. So if you look at the revenue potential, the revenue potential for this combination is no be, is not very good. We had we were in the two hundred thousand range, and now look, and if you took if you elected to do all the projects as they were, you could be you're looking at losing up to forty grand. Uh, or sorry, four hundred thousand, and you could make up to uh, let's see at ninety five percent, and then you could make up to uh, sixty. So so these are not very. So you've generated a lot of uncertainty in that, and the total effort. You know, if we if we state that our total effort is at one hundred and twenty days. So one of the other things why you would have those projects that were selected is just that you didn't have the band organizational bandwidth or capacity to do all of them. And if we look at that, at 120, 100% of this portfolio was unachievable, uh, at least in, the, in, this, in this capacity. So we need to filter through. So to, to come back to the, the point that let the flowers bloom, this is what it looks like. Obviously, this doesn't work. Um, before I get to the optimization part, any more questions? We do have one. Well, we have a number of them, but I'll read one. And uh, our folks, if, if we don't get a chance to address them all in this part or at the end, please feel free to email Eric. He'd, he'd like to hear yeah, from Yeah, I, I love answering your questions. I'm scrolling through it a little. Even if I sound <laughs> crabby about spreadsheets. <laughs> is, is, the, is the matrix for the selected portfolio in the spreadsheet? So the matrix over here, okay, if he's, if he's asking about. So we have the matrix over here. Okay. And, oh, okay. Yeah. and the way that it's done is that we, set, we fixed the, um, the, the axis at 50 and 50. And based on the way the point scoring works, so if you wanted to replicate this, what you would essentially that everything that is a is a uh, redesign. Oh, sorry, uh, is this a redesign? No, this is a spin-off. So everything you would spin off would be would have a a fit score of above 50 and a viability score of less than 50. So using using if statements, okay, or basically just by the scoring, okay. But you could you could actually pull using if statements. You could have just put names to those opportunities. Um, and it is in the spreadsheet, but it all comes out to being the math. So it's how you do your scoring. So the first thing you want to do is r relativize your score, 
and then the other one is to average out your fit. That's all it is. Okay? So how did I do this? Just again, because I promised I'd say. So if I have 5,000 to, to 150, that's a range of 150, each point is worth uh, 14,000, uh, sorry, 1, 1,450. Okay? And then I use that and I, and I divide this number by 14, and that's how I get it scored. So if I look at revenue potential over here at 5,000, you know, it's going to be pretty close to, um, if I had the specific score for it, here it is. See, it's not even a point. It's 0.38. And if it were below that, well, it's just a straight zero. So it, the, the one thing you want to remember is how you do, th is this. Now, Let's optimize this. So we're going to go and we're going to start Risk Optimizer. And But before that, actually, I would like to um, go back to our presentation. So how does stochastic or simulation optimization work? Well, the first thing in, we just talked about, we presented it, it's the model with the initial values. Then we take that. And, and then what, what Risk Optimizer and, and all these wonderful tools do is that they simulate the model baseline. So they'll take the way it is, they'll run it, and they'll say, hey, this is what this thing looked at at the beginning. Then you tell it, all right, I'm, I want you to change some decision variables, which in our case, if you, you that yellow column of ones and zeros, we, if it's a one, yes, I do this project, and if it's a zero, no, I don't. So it, it, it changes the decision variables, it re-simulates, and then it, then it stops again, and it looks at the baseline and says, did my result improve? Yes. Okay. Pursue that solution. So be, depending on the various search, and I, I'll explain this. Because you have their various search algorithms in the optim, risk optimizer, it will start looking at more refined, it'll, it'll take that, that solution set, and it'll tweak it until it, comes, until it can't tweak no more and has to do something else. So it, that's why it's still changing the variables if the results improved. If the result did not improve, it'll try a new solution set, and it'll still change the decision variables, but in a different way. If the result did improve, then it asks itself, is that solution optimal? If it's no, it keeps changing the solutions until it comes up to an optimal solution. So in the world of simulation optimization, the, the result just doesn't, it, no matter what it does, it just doesn't get any better and therefore you can consider it your model to have its optimal values. Optimization is not a quick process. These are things that sometimes you may consider letting run uh, uh, on a Friday night and, come hoping that you're, and hoping that when you come back it ran through everything and generated the report. Um, you know, if you had a power outage, whoops, it's gone. So these can be very long and they're recursive. It allows, so Simulation is what if, optimization is what's best. We're going to be looking at nonlinear problems, and like obviously simulation optimization requires simulation, so we need at risk. So risk optimizer is this nice little button. We'll look at this in there. We can we can optimize a wide variety of statistics. We can use as many constraints using simple logic as we want. We can build in logic using macros and special processing needs, and we can run it as long as we want. Okay, and this is what we're going to look at. So now that we've gone through the model, here are some of the things we could do. We could minimize, uh, maximize, sorry, the combined viability fit scoring. So this is to give us the best aligned portfolio to our needs. We could look at total profit. So we could abstract from how it fits to our, and we just look at how much money we'd pocket, and then uh, whether, it, whether it, target, it aligns with our business or not. And then revenue potential is, uh, is top-line optimization. On the other hand, we might decide that we are resource-constrained, so we want to minimize the total effort, while putting, and then we could constrain, for example, revenue potential. So we could say, if you, even if we only have you know, 100 days to throw at this, or 100 people, FTEs, we still need to generate more than, I don't know, $400,000 in revenue. We could look at organizational costs, which is a function of FTEs. 
And the other thing is we could decide that we want to invest in the things that where we have to do the least amount of research to be profitable in. And again, in both those cases, we can, we can set, when we minimize or maximize, we can set objectives for it. Revenue potential needs to be above this, how many maximum FTEs, maximum budget, maximum uh, VOI cost, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this comes back to the, our same gentleman, but with different questions. So now, now it, what's the likelihood of us making our number goes, comes to what is the best combination you know, that will, meet, will give me the highest returns? What is the best combination given the resources that I have? Um, what's the best combination that will be the most aligned to my business? So let's go back to our spreadsheet and see how that, that works out. So this is a good time to pause real quick. Questions? I'll scroll through. We might have some that uh, came in before. Um, I thought we might, unless you want to address it now, we might save a selecting a distribution talk for the end, or did you? Yeah, that, that's that's better for the end. Yes. <laughs> good. Anything else? Oh, could you just go over just briefly how you set set up the data? There's a little bit of confusion. Uh, what is the data? What is the SME estimates? And what fields are being generated from what distribution? There might be a little confusion there about that. Okay, so let's talk about the distributions. Okay, uh, not in this case because we're working uh, at a strategic level and we're pretty uncertain we used a triangular distribution for all the green cells okay so the green cells are your simulation or so you'll see risk triangular and it is referencing our input table over here okay so each one of these will have a green cell and because it's a triangular distribution pulling these numbers. And these numbers in the context of this model were provided either by the people doing the project, you know, the valuate the initial valuation, tell you, you know, what it's worth and what it would cost and all those estimates, or it's some it's an SME, so a subject matter expert which is assigning these values or a team of subject matter experts. Does that answer the that part of that question? So the data in this case wasn't fitted. It could have been, but it wasn't. Well, good. Yeah, that, did that did that address the the the? I'm not sure it made sense to me, and <laughs> so thanks. Okay. Um, <laughs> if there's if if there is still any other confusion, we can always deal with that. By the way, just so we look, this model is very dynamic. So when I hit F9, you can see that. As the values change, so does the so does the shape of the portfolio in the scatter diagram over here. So you can see that under certain circumstances, certain opportunities are uh, to be redesigned, uh, spun off. Some of them eventually will end up being killed, you know, um, depending on how often we and the dis there we go. Now we have two. So we're gonna op we're gonna run risk optimizer, and I'm just gonna explain how we do this. So the like I said. You can essentially do three things. You can minimize, you can maximize, or you can say, I want this value. So in our case, we're going to pick maximize. And sell C12. So C12 is our max scoring. So we want to maximize the mean of our max scoring, because what is of interest to us is to allocate our resources to the, the projects which make the most sense financially, operationally, and strategically to the business. Uh, now, and the others, we're going to use them as, um, as constraints. So we've set it up. And to set it up, we can, I'll just, uh, we basically say that our range over here, so cells B31, so I'm just, uh, actually, I won't be able to modify this because it's, it's um, filtered. But B31, all the way to the B47, which are, are the projects which are in the portfolio, can be set anywhere as an integer between 0 and 1. So that's how it's going to turn on and turn off the projects. And why that's important is because using a sum product 
I can say, well, what, some product, the B column, to any of the other ones, financial requirements, cost, so on. So it'll go one times the cost and sum it. And if it's zero, it'll just sum zero. And that's how you, it'll know how much it's doing. So that's, the, and, and of course, I mentioned you could do a bunch of statistics. We could give it kurtosis, variance, min, max, ranges. So depending on the type of problem you're working with, you can use any of these statistics to, to but for us, at most commonly, you would work with the mean. Now, we only have one constraint here. And I'm just going to see if I can pull it up. So what we're saying is cell C7, OK, is our total effort. So all the projects which are selected, as they are now, are, are coming out to 274. But we need it to be a maximum, and that's why we set up a cell over here we could input of 120. So it can be between anywhere, but this value can be anywhere between 0 and 120. And it's a hard constraint. So if it doesn't meet it, meet it, it, it puts it as unmet. And I'll show you how that can be very powerful uh, very quickly. Um, I'm going to run it just for a few minutes. Now, we, I'm, I'm going to create another uh, constraint, OK, which, is, which we're going to call budget. So we're going to add. And we're going to say that uh, the, um, we're going to call it here budget. And we're going to say that the minimum is 0, the range to constrain, okay, which is our total organizational uh, investment, okay, needs to be a maximum of 5,000. And we'll probably readjust that because that's kind of low for our, our purposes. And then we'll take another one where we're going to add VOI. So we're going to add another. This is where once you have it run the optimization long enough and you get the results, this is where you can start making some multidimensional analysis because each one of these are different dimensions on which you can optimize or constrain. So again, we're going to take the range to constrain, which is VOI. And it could be a percentage. So we could have taken that percentage number uh, as well. And we're going to say it's going to be a maximum, uh, we'll, we'll put it elsewhere, but a maximum of, um, we'll say, $6,000. So now, what our port, so now when we're going to optimize, basically our effort has to be less than 120. Our budget must be less than 5000 so for the investment, the capital uh, we'll change that. And the hard number here uh, for the VOI, it, so our v needs to be less. So how much it would cost for better information, 6000 So in total, you know, 11000 between those two. And now we're going to run it, and then I'll show you the easy bake version after. So while it's doing this, it's basically doing an analysis, and then we're going to do the settings very quickly. So uh, runtime, and then we'll set the simulations just to, I don't know, uh, 250 using Latin Hypercube. Uh, no, we can, we don't, we're not going to constrain that. We're going to constrain that in the iterations, iterations, 250. And it, you know, it's set to run on Latin Hypercube. So we're all set, so we can do, and of course, the more, the more you let it, you know, the more trials you run, the better it is, uh, but for the sake of expediency. And now what we're going to see is it's going to be, okay, uh, so we set some constraints which were a little hard on it, and now we're, now it's going to try and Opti initialize and it's going to start turning on and turning off projects and eventually when it's going to because I'm not able to let's see if we can look at the solution scape so what it's telling us is that it it wasn't able to meet any criteria so now um, it's starting to turn on and turn off the projects as you can see 
to try and improve the the, um, the objective of having a, a max score maximizing the max scoring. So but at, as we can see, none of the constraints are being met. Okay, so it's going to keep it's going to keep shutting off and shutting down projects until it can meet those constraints. And I'll show you what the the results will look like um, afterwards. So let's talk about what what this watcher window is producing for us. So. We have two charts. So this one is telling us what are the results or the improvement in results. And here are how many simulations. So this is just telling you what the last 50 have generated. And this one is telling you what the overall improvement was for uh, um, the, the optimization. So it enables you to give a, a much better view. Now I think over here it's looking at total investment. So. So now we have 12, so obviously what's happening is that um, we have one solution, simulation number 12, where we made, met our constraints. So we can actually go and look at that and see that simulation number 12, and here are the projects that it turned on and turned off to achieve that. Um, we have a log of all the things that, have, that are being done, so which project combinations that, it, that it's seen, and it'll tell you if it's meeting its which criteria is being met. So obviously the criteria is very stringent and it's not able to do anything. So we can either let it keep running until it, it stumbles into the right criteria or we can go and readjust our constraints more um, effectively. And then the constraint solver looks at the budget. So probably the budget is not right. And that's, so we're going to stop this, do an iteration, Yes, and we're just going to change these very quickly. We're going to leave the original, and it produces a report, produces uh, what solutions were generated. Okay, so let's go back to our model settings, our model definition. Okay, so the VOI we're going to edit. We'll put that at 10,000. OK, and then we should have it. And then over here, we're all set. Mean, so C12 is our max scoring. Very good. Um, and now it's preparing. OK, very good. So now that's done. And, okay, so my apologies, it's a little distracting trying to uh, finish the sentence with the phone ringing. All right, so now we go back to our settings, uh, cancel, and we're going to put this to 10,000. And now when we're going to run it, it's going to go through the same process, and just, just because we, we, uh, we might want to... Uh, There we go. And we have a hard constraint here, so let's try this. And when and if you pay attention to the chart in the corner, you'll see what the port what the optimization mix looks like every time that it re, it finishes. And we'll pull pull up the um, the chart. And this is what we're looking at here. So when, if you let this model run for about a half hour, okay, it will stabilize at 1,000. And you'll see that the various, mind you, 250 trials is not bad. And if you using Latin Hypercube because it's stratified sampling. And if you let this run long enough, it will, it will increase it, and it will give you the max point scoring, and it will respect how much uh, value of information, how much effort that you can do, and how much budget, which are basically your multiple dimensions. Which, so um, I guess this is a good time to ask while it's running if there are any questions, if 
you know, does this seem like something useful? Any questions, Jameson? I, we, we have a couple questions that uh, they'll, I'm not sure if everybody's asking them. It's the, maybe you could talk more about the, how you explain the difference between the Monte Carlo simulation and the Latin hypercube simulation. You referred to it as stratified. That was really interesting. OK. So, well, the stratified sampling basically means that main difference between Latin hypercube and uh, and it's unfortunate I don't have a um, I don't have a slide to explain it, but uh, in essence, Latin hypercube is an uh, is a methodology which will force uh, the simulation engine to push certain samples in each of the bins. So all of the bins get an equal amount, no matter how many trials. All the bins will get will get some trials to make sure that it evens out, and then it there's some there's some little mathematical wizardry that happens to make the statistics. Uh, now the reason now the, and whereas with Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo is purely random, and there is none of this there is none of this uh, uh, logic or thinking that is forcing the engine to put these things into bins. It's just generating its numbers. So. Um, Latin hypercube will generate will approximate a Monte Carlo with fewer trials. The the best way to do it is Monte Carlo, but if you have a model that takes you know five minutes to run a thousand trials or twenty or models I've seen which take twenty twenty five minutes a half hour just to run one set of trials, you might you might say to yourself you know. Um, I'd rather be working with less than, than you know a thousand. Maybe I'll be want five hundred or two hundred and fifty, because performance penalty against the accuracy is 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 not worth it. So we call that in hypercube. As a general rule, I always re recommend that if you're going to run a model for less than a thousand trials, you should be running in Latin hypercube as a rule of thumb. Does that uh, and thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great, great answer. So uh, any other questions? I have one. I, I, uh, I'm going to read it. How do you choose the random number generator and probability distributions? So it's a, just a risk optimizer question. Yeah. Well, to be perfectly honest with you, um, as a risk analysis professional, um, I tend to be uh, someone who w focuses on the process, and sometimes th there are things that I tend to abstract from. And the random number generator, though I understand how they work, and I know that I, I, the, just the basic Marcin twister, for example, is a very good one. They're, 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 they're all kind of pretty equivalent for the level of accuracy that we're looking for. Uh, so. That that I probably abstract from, and you know you could just leave it on the default. Now for the probability distribution, that's different. That that there's a uh, there's a very deliberate choice in place, and I'll explain it. Because we are working with expert assessment in this particular model, and we don't have empirical data, and we have decided to use triangulars. So I could have. So you have two. Uh, you have three basic distributions you can use for expert assessment. You have the two-point uniform, which has a very, very high degree of standard deviation, which means a lot of risk, because your lowest point is as probable as your highest point, uh, so no tails. And then you have the triangular, which has, you know, it has no tails because you know it has a min and a, and a max. It's the sum of two, basically two uniforms, and that. Uh, you know, it, it has a high standard. So given the le relative level of uncertainty, we picked that one because we could have used, again, in three points, a beta pert, which is a much smoother uh, bell-shaped distribution, which has lower standard deviation, which inherently is less risky. So if you were picking one of these distributions, if you, if you had no knowledge and, and felt very uncertain, you'd take a, a uniform. If you, you feel you can bind your problem with a min, max, and a most likely, but you still feel kind of uncertain, 
you go with a triangular. And if you feel pretty confident about that, that three-point distribution, you can use a beta pert. Oh. That, and that's not what that's going into the discussion of fitting. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's good. That, I, that answered our other question that we were going to save to the end, too. That's a great introduction and a great way of thinking about it. Thank you for that. I, I like to hear the, I like to wrap my head around what you just said. <laughs> well, as long as it's coherent, right? <laughs> no, it's good. It, uh, it answers a question that I wondered about, and it's a great way of breaking things down. Say we're going to start with three distributions, how we're going to look at things, and thank you for that answer. Oh, my pleasure. Um, by the way, you'll notice that we're 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 uh, we're cruising over here at twenty tw almost twenty one fifty. So we've basically been running this thing for seven minutes, and we've done a forty percent improvement in the way it aligns our target portfolio in in to to what we're doing. And we'll notice that there are a couple of items here which were discarded over here, and. Uh, You'll see that the the number the com the project combinations that it's electing so the ones that rank best how unfortunate that the screen refresh is not uh, happening here but we I'll pause this or I'll stop this here I'm just going to stop it because this is good enough for for what I need so yes okay and then we're going to take the best over here and we're going to hit okay and. What I what I always recommend, okay, and this is this is a little thing that I, I you know I think it makes for very pretty reporting, but it's kind of tedious when I want to sort through the results. It produces you a results report, okay, and all you have to do is you take this sucker over here and you just go to the data tab and you say filter, and then what you want to do is you want to figure out first thing is that you want to take what are the um, what you want to sort the largest to smallest. So now we know what the solution, and then we can start analyzing what the project combinations were. And then what happens if over here we don't, we don't want to we don't want to be bothered by uh, things where we're not meeting our constraint or con um, our constraints. So we can just wow. Okay, so it all met. All right. So now we know what were the results, what were the various, and then we can consider these. So if the, the best combination isn't the one we really wanted, we can look at what are, were some of the alternative solutions that it came up with and evaluate these based on their mean uh, scoring for viability and fit. Pretty cool, no? <laughs> And then the only thing you would have to do, you know, if you decided you preferred another project combination than the one you had, you know, and you'll notice that there's a lot of local optimization hap happening for these five. So if these five all have the exact same solution scape, and these ones don't, they are a little different. So you can see how it came up with the various combinations. And you have the summary over here. And we'll just uh, very quickly to wrap up. So now that we've seen the results, so if we took this new combination, we see that Project 11 is ranked number one, Project 8, and based on the cost that we have, 22 always seems to be appearing, so it must be a very strategic project. Eight, we're net, we've brought up our portfolio revenue potential. We've essentially doubled it. We've maintained it underneath 100 days. And for a total capital expenditure of $1,000, and five thousand dollars in VOI. So let's uh, let's just uh, just simulate it for a thousand trials to, for for giggles, and then we'll be we're almost done. We'll be able to do the Q and A. There, excellent. So now, let's just take our. Um, so we we'll, we notice that our VOI never goes above six thousand, which is beautiful because we didn't have any more money than that to begin with. Our um, our estimated profit potential. So we have a ninety five percent chance of doing better than thirty thirty thousand. 
we have a a 90% chance of doing better than 350. We have a mean result of um, of about 600,000. So we've ba our mean has increased by 200,000 in what our por portfolio could generate. And our, in terms of cost, we've managed to keep the to total cost uh, at, at a reasonable rate, which is very stable. So that pretty much is our VOI, is our VOI model. And if we looked at these guys, we would know that this would be a redesign um, and this would be a spin-off and we have a bunch of healthy opportunities in our uh, and this is and this is what it would look like so as you've noticed the projects themselves have changed a bit you know which ones were the the top ranked mm -hmm. so there you go um, thank you very much uh, for taking the time to listen I guess we can we thank can you, switch back to to the Wait. PowerPoint and do here by the way is the optimization chart we were looking at earlier mm -hmm. Here are the sample results that we can analyze, and here we are. I think we can have what time for two more questions. How's that? And then we better let you go. Oh, well, no problem. Let's see if we have any more coming in. We do have uh, Jean-Philippe says thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Again, if uh, I'm, I'll send out your contact info, Eric, and then people can email you any questions that come up. I'm glad we were able to address some of the questions during the presentation that, that seemed to work just fine. Uh, yes, uh, we, I can send, can I send out your slides? Yeah, uh, the, I'll, um, I'll prepare a PDF version of the slides okay, and great. everybody is welcome to the slides. Perfect, thank you. And uh, we've got reviews coming in that says it was excellent and I, I think so too. And, and thank you everybody. I, perhaps we don't have any more questions. Well, that's either I bored everybody or I was very clear. <laughs> I, think we're, I think we're in good shape. Well, again, right. uh, uh, sometime later today or early tomorrow, you will receive more information. And I uh, uh, want to thank everybody for coming, and I especially want to thank Eric. Yeah, I, well, it was, uh, it was my pleasure. And uh, if there's... Um, and if you guys have any um, here, I'm just uh, can the basic process for simulation work performed? Um, I don't know. I don't know what he. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Interesting. Okay. Well, um, if you if you have any questions, you can always uh, so you can always uh, write them at etorque at technologypartners.com. By the way. Uh, our contact information is over here. Um, my email is etorque at technologypartners.com, and my extension is extension 101. So if you want, some, I know some people are asking a few questions in the, in, um, so in the panel. If they want to send me that uh, directly, I'll be happy to uh, answer them as best as I can. And if you're watching this in the future, if you're watching this recording, that you that also on our true. website, welcome, and uh, you can certainly email questions to Eric then too. All right, well, I'll sign off then. Great. Thanks, Eric.